دقیقه الان ای تیفه یو کامرا لکس اپ سایدان یا Hi. Oh, oh, great, great. <laughs> still at Beijing? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, today. Oh. Hey there, how are you? Hello. Hey, John. Aaron, you're in Beijing. Yeah, um, I was supposed to give a talk today at um, some cases there, so I'm just giving it um, online instead. No, no. So there's um, there's going one to Jinghua later. Yeah, so there's one Dian Taifeng near Jinghua that serves that makes the um, Uh, foie gras, uh, xiao long bao. Oh. <laughs> Not all of them do it, but one of them does it. Wow. Wow. The restaurant is still there? Uh, I mean, I hope so, but uh-huh. I think there's only one that does it. So anyway, <laughs> just say it. <laughs> I'm kind of getting sick of Din Tai Fung, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, but, but um, foie gras, right? I mean, it's like it's special. Yeah. 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 I did. Yeah. Hey Aaron, hey Zlo, hey. hi John. Hey John, how are you? Good, good, good to see you. Great to see you. Jun, you got all the weight. <laughs> Should I share my slide and give a try? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes, please, please. Cool. You see it clearly? I don't have a lot of movies, so it should be okay. Okay. Tifa, can you check your slides? Yeah. You see my slides? Yeah. I'm moving. All right. Okay. Sure. Looks good. Okay. So long. I was in Anhui uh, last week. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I was traveling around the uh, Hangzhou and um, when the Beijing started to show a few cases, and uh, uh-huh. then I will quickly stop by a lot of uh, stops or require a COVID test. And luckily, I had that, so yeah. all clear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This time, there's, there's a few cases come from Mongolia, people said. It's not traveling around. Man. I thought it came from Shanghai. Funny. I thought they went from Shanghai, Shanghai no, to no, Mongolia. No, uh, uh, no it's, uh, origin, it's uh, the, the, uh, the older retired people the, the from Shanghai, but they didn't get from Shanghai. They traveled to the somewhere uh, sightseeing uh, around, around the area. And then originally, uh, some area already got it. So they, So original the sources yeah. is from Mongolia somewhere, so it's from all around. Yeah. So, so is it is it a Delta variant or has it been confirmed as a Delta I variant? I guess you? so. Yes, um, I, I should maybe if it's from that that country. So uh, originally from uh, uh, early this year is all Delta from Guangzhou. The the sequencing confirmed that, but this this time, yeah. Um, You haven't the official report yet. When I was a postdoc, there was someone in the lab who would always 
clean their bench and make it perfectly clean every day. And I always thought that that was, that just didn't make sense to get like zero dirt. So a pillow stock trying to get like every single case away and <laughs> it's going to be impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People starting to realize that uh, it's hard to yeah. Does it make sense? get everything clean. Yeah. My wife went, was in Beijing last week and then she said she was home and someone just came and knocked on the, our apartment and just started asking oh. her where in Beijing she was. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been with last, last weekend. Yeah, yeah. And I always, I oh, do they do they come? Okay. Uh, no, no. They, but they I, know I get a call. Yeah, yeah. They know where you uh, were though, so I don't know why they have to. Call. Uh, no, uh, not exactly, not exactly. So uh, last weekend I was Beijing, so I got a call a uh, couple uh, yesterday, uh, asked where I've been in Beijing. So I was, it's not in the supposed the dangerous area. That's fine. I see. Yeah, you, you you don't have the precise location according to the cell phone. <laughs> You so, don't have that. So yet. somebody, <laughs> somebody's reading all that AI output data. It's yeah. Impressive. It's so impressive. They, they just, they just know they are being you'll you'll be around some area, being around city, but they couldn't have the precise location because that was that was kind of police department work, right? So yeah. yeah, but if you see in the in the online, like they'll say one person in Beijing's surname Cho. He went <laughs> to a pharmacy. Then he went to play cards with his friends. Then he went to oh, this store. Yeah. Then he... yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got famous. Then. Yeah. They list their whole itinerary. Uh, so you, you will still, still visit some lab in Tsinghua, right? Of the talk, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, on, yeah. I'm, I'm teach, teaching a class on Thursday and then giving a oh, talk on Friday. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to see Xiao Chen on Wednesday in biophysics. Cool, cool, cool. We're we're having a joint group meeting on single single cell. Oh. John, is Xiao Chen involved in any cell sentence projects? I'm not sure. Xiao Chen, Xiao Chen Wang. Perhaps there's like. Some of the early three of, there's like three or four or five hundred people involved, so I couldn't tell you offhand. Right? You're the boss. Yeah, but you know. Okay, uh, or maybe we can get started. I have a, a little sure. long introduction for TFA. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, we'll have some great talks today. I'll just quickly announce that next week, two more talks. Uh, we have Akanksha Singvi and we, from um, Fred Hutch, and we have Yan Gu from Zhejiang University, both talking about GLIA. So please tune in for that. And um, take a look at the website. We have some great talks coming up. We have um, uh, acupuncture and neural circuits. We have um, revisiting reprogramming of astrocytes to neurons and uh, phase separation of synaptic proteins and many exciting things coming up. Uh, okay, so long, you're up. Okay, great. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce TPAUM. So uh, first time I met TPA is uh, the first month I come back to China. 2009, so I received the email that says, uh, uh, yeah, my name is Tipe, I want to work in your lab. Uh, I was particularly interested in uh, electric physiology. So, well, it has, uh, uh, this, this, uh, has, uh, this student has very beautiful language, English language, uh, but, I, uh, but I, I, I realized I, I, I'm not an electric physiologist, so I re refer Tipe to uh, uh, Cheng, Yu, Cheng Yu Li's lab. But uh, later on, but uh, TPA uh, have uh, started his career amazingly well. Uh, he, he quickly has an intern in Taiwan. Uh, after after that, he decided to have a, a master degree in University of Hong Kong. And uh, after master degree, uh, he went to uh, Switzerland to work with uh, Christine Lucia as a PhD. So after train as a um, neuro secretary uh, working mice. He come back to China. Uh, firstly, uh, first uh, work in the uh, Nanjing Normal University. Where he uh, he started work with uh, uh, physicians, work with clinical problem. Um, after published a, a 
a couple of very interesting people. He moved to uh, Shanghai Mental Health Hospital, where is a big one of the biggest uh, mental health hospital in China, where he started a meeting uh, journey to use the uh, neural modulation, particularly to to study the intact human brain. So where he had made a serious discovery to use the uh, neural modulation, uh, including the transcranial magnetic stimulation, to study how the different manipulation might affect it the uh, uh, psychiatric stated states. Okay, so uh, today we are very happy to have Tifei with us to talk about his latest. Okay, welcome Tifei. Hi, you see my slides? Right, go ahead. So okay. I really thanks uh, Aaron Sloan for organizing this. It's a pleasure to share my stuff. Uh, projects here. So the talk of my, um, the title for my talk will be The Motoric Changes. Before that, I want to mention this is a, a movie. So um, in France, this is a play, um, the de play, uh, Don't Get Us Away. So it's, uh, I act, therefore I think. So it means uh, from the consciousness level, you feel who you are after you do it. So it's, um, um, kind of um, in, in a theory, hypothesizing um, the importance, the potential importance of the uh, uh, model system. So the topic of my, ta uh, my talk will be motoric changes. So drug addiction is something um, quite important. And uh, so in China estimation, we have 30 million illegal drug users. And uh, so like 10 years before, it's mainly heroin. And now it's 80% uh, of methamphetamine. And this does not include the smoking, alcohol, internet, and WeChat um, addiction like problems. So what's the mechanism for addiction? So addiction is um, commonly believed to be mediated by the dopamine signaling. So you can easily classify the addictive drug into different class. For example, you have um, morphine and heroin which will um, act on the male opioid, male opioid receptor on GABA neuron, which will uh, disinhibit the dopamine neuron. And this will increase dopamine. The second class is, uh, um, is like uh, the nicotine, and you can directly act on the dopamine neuron, which you can increase the dopamine neuron firing directly. And the third class is like a cocaine, methamphetamine, and amphetamine. It will block the um, transportation of the dopamine back into the axon terminal which also increased the uh, dopamine in the um, downstream regions, including the nucleus accumbens. So from this figure, you can know that most uh, uh, addictive drugs can increase the uh, dopamine system, and this will um, like be the permissive uh, switch for the addiction behavior. So what's the secondary, the cellular mechanism underlying the addiction memory and the formation? Uh, so after all the drugs have been washed out from the body, what's, what has been left within the brain is something we call synaptic plasticity. And the most uh, um, uh, important finding in the past like 20 years is that, so within just a single shot of cocaine, after 24 hours, you see um, here, this is a, a dopamine neuron, and you see um, the saline trace animals still show the plasticity, while the cocaine animals, you, ex you occlude the synaptic plasticity. And with like five days of cocaine injection, you see the plasticity occlusion selectively on the dopamine one receptor expression MSNs in the nucleus commons, but not in the D2 MSNs. So the plasticity go from the dopamine neuron to the downstream region. And after 10 days of self-administration and you wait for like a month, you see that uh, in the methamphetamine um, self-administration rates, and you see the plasticity is gone, but which is the remained intact in the control animals. So um, this suggests that, so within the formation of the addiction, you see progressive changes in different brain areas, which initiate from dopamine system to downstream regions and go to the cortex. However, this is mediated by the changes in plasticity. So what's the importance of the plasticity? So people have tried to erase this uh, synaptic plasticity with the optogenetic-based in vivo LTD induction. So if you 
if you remove, you use optogenetic stimulation, you repeatedly targeting the nucleus accumbens and dopamine system, you can actually remove the SNAP plasticity induced by the addictive drugs. And uh, after which you can remove the addiction behavior. However, there are many differences uh, of the uh, big, huge gap between the animal study and the human study. First, the human brain is really large. And secondly, people, for example, this is a poem written by uh, Russia. So the first experience with cocaine, and he believed that in the beginning, happiness was the intensity. And after that, uh, after he used cocaine a lot, he began to associate different external events that can uh, be linked with the use of cocaine, such as the people who use the drug and also the environment who use it. So how to um, make the gap, how to uh, fulfill the gap. So uh, one important aim of our lab is translating the plasticity for different therapy and uh, to uh, treat the brain disease. So what do we do? Um, we use different approaches. So just uh, uh, to mention one of it, which is a um, transcranial magnetic stimulation based approach. So the principle of the TMS is actually you place a coil over your, uh, over your skull and once you pass a transient current into the into the coil, you can induce a, a like a transient magnetic field that can pass your scale and induce another current within your cortex. So every time you stimulate a different region of the cortex, you can see that the human uh, cortical areas can respond differentially with spatial and temporal distribution of the response. And if you repeatedly touch the one cortical region. So first with single pass, you can map the cortical connectivity within the brain. And you see the difference between a healthy brain and the addicted one. And secondly, if you repeatedly touch the one brain region, you can actually create a plasticity and you can also uh, manipulate the brain functions. So uh, one big advance has been made in 2005. So John Roswell lab in UCL, they actually developed a, a great protocol to define the cortical plasticity in human. So with different uh, ways of intervals. So ITBS is you have more intervals and the CTBS you have no intervals. Just with playing the interval and the frequency within the pulse, you can see that you can either create a potentiation with ITBS or a depression with CTBS. So within this approach, you can actually really measure the human cortical plasticity non-invasively with TMS. So um, the first line of work we do is we try to compare and we try to look for investigate the um, evidence of plasticity changes on human patients. So we first recruit to the methamphetamine patients and we uh, compare this with healthy subjects. So in the black line, you see that with the 10 Hertz TMS, you can actually induce potentiation in the control subjects. However, this is abolished in the methamphetamine subjects. Sorry, this is the, exactly the um, similar finding you can see with the animal brain slice experiments. Also with the CTBS, when you induce depression on healthy subjects, and also the fact is uh, gone in the methamphetamine subjects. So you can see that in the uh, drug addiction population, you have bidirectional impairment of stack plasticity. And this might be important for their, their failure to adjust their behavior. Another important finding is that if we, we know that methamphetamine is a psychostimulant and after you use the drug, you can be awake for like uh, 10 hours or 20 hours. However, another opioid uh, uh, drug such as heroin, it's induced you to calm down. However, if you have all the drugs washed out in your body, what's left in the brain is that you see the similar thing in heroin subjects. So in the control drug subject, you still see the potentiation. However, in the heroin subjects, you also see the uh, impaired cortical plasticity. And if you have the abstinence from the drug for like two years, and you see the plasticity can actually recover. Also the impairment of plasticity is actually correlated to the craving for the drug. So, so this means that the cortical plasticity is, is firstly impaired in a drug addiction population. It could be universal across different drugs and it could also be induced, it, it could be also used as a neurophysiological marker for the psychological changes. 
And we also try to correlate the impaired plasticity to the behavioral meaning. So we found that the behavior adjustment uh, reflected by the relearning ability is actually impaired in both animal and actually also in human subjects. So we also try to um, examine the potential molecular mechanism underlying the cortical plasticity changes. So we have two lines of uh, search. The first is the uh, uh, glutamatic transmission. The second one is the GABA transmission. So within the glutamatic transmission, we actually identify the novel uh, gluin 3A uh, containing AMDA receptors. We know that if you have the 3A um, subunit into the AMDA receptor, you actually have the um, like 25% uh, calcium influx left compared to the 2A to B mediated one. So we believe that this, this could be one important uh, mediator for the uh, out of the cortical plasticity. The second line is that we, act we actually compare the different uh, GABAergic uh, receptors. So one very um, significant that you can see here is mediated by the GABA-B receptor expression. So we see it's a selective in the motor cortex. It's not uh, the same in hip cameras. So it's uh, quite uh, selective. And with the electrophysiology, we actually prove the function of the, of the change with either the baclofen evoked current or actually the uh, synaptic spillover experiment, which show that exactly the GABA B receptor function is actually impaired in the pyramidal neuron, a layer five in motor cortex. So what's the potential function of the motor cortical changes in GABA B receptor? So uh, one important hypothesis is that GABA B actually um, induced uh, long lasting the cortical inhibition it has a peak like 100 milliseconds. So actually it might mediate some like uh, um, long process of the psychological pro uh, processing. So we actually uh, subject the animal to, um, to the like uh, motor impulsivity uh, test. So the animal each time ting in the open field, it could ting uh, very rapidly or it could ting like uh, uh, more uh, smoothly. So you can see that we use the moment uh, velocity as the a surrogate for the motor impulsivity. And we see that after the alcohol exposure in the addiction condition, you can see the increase in the motor impulsivity. And if we use the baclofen, as I mentioned before, it's an agonist for the GABA B receptor, we see the um, impulsivity is actually can be reversed immediately. And if we subject the uh, baclofen to the local region in M1, selectively in the primary motor cortex, you, are, you can also see the effect. So this evidence suggests that, so selective uh, restoration of GABA-B receptor function in motor cortex, you can al already um, reduce the motor impulsivity. So also we identify the uh, phosphorylation targets as a serine seven L three, I just quickly mentioned. But the most important clinical meaning for this is that we can actually measure this on human subjects with the uh, uh, TMS technique again. So as I mentioned before, with uh, single pulse uh, TMS uh, stimulation, you can actually evoke a, a continuous wave of cortical excitation and inhibition balance. So if we have the uh, first exciting hit, first pulse here, and we measure like after 100 milliseconds, and after 100 milliseconds, you actually have the peak for the GABA B receptor mediated inhibition. So the second pulse will actually be inhibited by the first pulse. So if we calculate the ratio of inhibition, we can actually measure the ability of the GABA-B receptor uh, uh, functioning. So you can see the panel C here in the control subjects, which in the healthy subjects, you can see um, the, the, the inhibition is like 90% because you have only less than 10% left. However, if you look at the alcohol or the addiction population, you have 40% left, which means you can only inhibit uh, 60%. Uh, so this means you have the reduced GABA B function as you observe the animals. And the second, uh, which is the most important thing is that you can see the individual uh, distribution. So in some subjects, you have uh, good inhibition. In some subjects, you doesn't have. As I mentioned before, um, uh, we can use the baclofen to treat the motor impulsivity for the addiction subjects. And now we have the golden standard to predict who is the responder or not. So if one subject has a good uh, response or a good inhibition, 
he will not respond to the baclofen treatment because it's already in the top level of inhibition. However, if he, if he has a, a very low level of inhibition or impaired um, uh, significantly, and these subjects will be uh, likely to be a good responder for the drug. So with, it, with, with this treatment, we can firstly measure the level of individualized uh, impulsivity, which is uh, very precisely with the neurophysiology. And secondly, we can also use this to guide our uh, clinical treatment. So um, as I mentioned uh, before, we can actually use the TMS to map the brain and we can measure the cortical functioning and we can identify potential different changes in the human brain. This will allow us to touch the cortical plasticity and we can actually treat the addiction. So we can still use the same technique. Uh, um, how, um, for sure, we can use other, um, other like electrical stimulation, ultrasound stimulation as well. But the TMS is clinically available from almost all the hospitals. So we use this a lot. So the most uh, um, significant difference between a drug and a TMS treatment is that, for example, drug goes everywhere to the brain, uh, to, to the body, and you can see uh, different side effects uh, of the body. However, the TMS only touches the brain. It directly goes to the neural circuits and it directly repairs the neural circuits and alters the function. And it will have very limited side effects, if any. So uh, in past like five to uh, six years, we have been initiated a lot of treatments uh, by uh, targeting the prefrontal cortex. And I just want to quickly mention, uh, we, have a, um, we have many different papers in this topic. Um, so the major conclusion is that if we treat the prefrontal cortex at left, right, and a different frequency combination, we can uh, reduce the uh, craving for the drug, both for heroin and methamphetamine. We can improve the sleep quality of these people during abstinence. We can reduce their anxiety and we can reduce their uh, uh, withdrawal symptom. And we can um, also treat the depression symptom for these subjects. And also we can also in, uh, improve their working memory uh, capacity um, by treating the uh, prefrontal cost, uh, cortical system. And also recently, uh, based on our finding in the motor cortical system, we recently proposed that we can use the target to treat the impulsivity. So this is a, um, a sub-signal task. And you can see um, if we inhibit the prefrontal cortex, we see the improvement. And if we inhibit the left uh, motor cortex, we also see the improvement, but it could be um, differentially into the different uh, processing stages. However, if we touch the right, uh, those lateral prefrontal cortex, we, we did not see an effect. So this is a good sign to start, and we are trying to uh, measure more like uh, um, uh, risk of decision-making behaviors. And also it is proposed that motor cortex could be a good target for pain and potentially for compulsion. So all these um, type of topics will be important for addiction treatment to fully rehabilitate the patient. So to conclude, I think I'm showing you um, some um, early evidence that we can prove that uh, motor cortical plasticity is actually changed in drug addiction. It might code in for um, the, 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 the like, uh, drug use motor habits. It could be uh, coding for the cognition changes and it could, uh, it could also um, include for the motor impulsivity. And secondly, motor cortex could be an important therapeutic uh, uh, target with non-invasive brain stimulation. So now we can, because uh, the skull here is very thin compared to the frontal part, so it's uh, quite easily to target and it also has a, a, a therapeutic meaning uh, in drug addiction patients. Thank you for your attention. Great, great. Thank you for your amazing talk. So uh, to start with question time, I might have a first quick question. So would you suggest that the TMS manipulations kind of can increase the inhibition in either an PXC and motor cortex, right? Um, yeah, so um, so actually I showed the plasticity is bidirectionally yeah. modulated. So if you, you can put in the you can put in the cortex and uh -huh. if you use the other protocol, you can actually depress it. So for example, if you have a hallucination, you can just suppress the cortex function. And you can right. you will not hear that. Yeah, but I'm I'm surprised by the quick de decrease of GABA GABA B receptor uh, mm -hmm. after uh, uh, addiction, right? So how long mm -hmm. that was 
to have a heavy observed in the mouse codex to the decrease so, of the uh, protein level of GABA-B receptor? Yeah, so so the chronic model is like seven days of modeling, yeah. and we also yeah. have 14 days of stints. So it's okay. already um, like three weeks of uh, uh, treatment. Oh, okay, so high. Yeah, so it actually is a chronically induced change. Mm -hmm. Right, questions. Let me follow on. So, would you think that activation uh, plasticity in the motor cortex might have some uh, input output to the to, to, to dopaminergic neuron? So, so why is uh, yeah? So um, so so there has been a, a paper um, in brain uh, two thousand ten. Uh -huh. So it's actually show the cortical stimulation. So if uh -huh. you target the TFC, you can increase uh -huh. dopamine in the um, in the ventral stratum, and if you target the motor cortex. You increase okay. in dorsal stratum. So, and this also, yeah, so, so also targeting the motor cortex helps the PD treatment, the Parkinson's disease. Yeah, but I'm curious why this can direct input to the, um, the dopaminergic pathway. So, why we need this primary motor cortex, right? <laughs> it's a very, yeah. very interesting circuitry. Oh. Yeah, so you so motor cortex send uh, abundant uh, projection to many many yeah. different areas in the brain. So okay. it's one of the um, it's just one of the uh, most important cortical areas. So it's okay. uh, it's uh, it's sending to um, um, to the uh, striatal pathways. It's sending to uh, including also the classroom. So okay. it, it 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 actually goes many many places. And also you have the um, repeated oscillation between the motor and ST region. So that could be many uh, network effects that has not been fully understood with TMS. Okay. Yeah. All right, so long. Should we go to the next one? Sure. Uh, but you can still type your question in the chat bar. Okay. See if you can answer that. Thanks. Thanks, Tifei. Thank Thanks, Hello. Great talk, Tifei. Thanks so much. Okay, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, my friend and colleague, Jun Ding. Actually, Jun is my favorite colleague at Stanford, and he's a wonderful scientist. Uh, Jun is an associate professor in the Department of neurosurgery at Stanford. And um, before coming to Stanford, he re uh, received his undergraduate degree in um, East China Normal University in Shanghai. I haven't visited that university yet. Um, and then he did a master's degree also in Shanghai at uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and then came to uh, Northwestern uh, University in Chicago for his uh, PhD, where he worked with uh, James Surmeyer and had a uh, very productive, um, impactful uh, PhD, where he studied um, striatal circuitry and signaling um, within uh, interneurons. And here he uh, discovered that um, by studying uh, synaptic plasticity in the striatum, he discovered um, that uh, corticostriatal and thalamostriatal projection systems um, have different ways of, uh, or distinct ways of coding information. This uh, resulted in um, several important publications, which uh, catapulted him to a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School with Bernardo Sabatini. And here he developed and deployed uh, super resolution um, imaging, uh, brain slices. Uh, he was able to go beyond the diffraction limit and generate um, 
stunning, detailed, uh, cover-worthy images of the structure of uh, dendritic spines um, uh, up to 100 microns below the surface of uh, these uh, brain slices. And this technique has been super powerful. And then he came to Stanford, where he's um, just been making uh, tremendous insight. He's a great colleague, a great, a wonderful neuroscientist, and um, looking forward to hearing his latest. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Aaron. That's a really kind introduction. Uh, also, thank uh, Zilong and for you know organizing this amazing event. Actually, I was surprised that Zilong was introducing me because Zilong and I went way back. We took uh, some master and <laughs> doctor classes together in Shanghai. So yeah, great to be here. And uh, today I'm going to talk about unpublished work from my lab, uh, talk um, linking two seemingly unrelated subjects together. One is uh, synucleins, one is uh, endocannabinoids. So what do I mean about uh, these two unrelated stuff together? Um, we, the story really starts from uh, afsynuclein. Afsynuclein is, uh, um, I would say, one of the uh, most famous uh, molecules in uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So it's uh, uh, one of the major components of Lewy bodies. And uh, the genetics of uh, uh, afsynuclein and its relationship to neurodegenerative disease has been really well explored. Uh, first, a uh, point mutation of afsynuclein was identifi identified in multiple uh, familial uh, Parkinson's disease cases. And then these two papers were um, pretty famous, afsynuclein triplications and duplications can cause severe early onset uh, Parkinson's disease. And because, um, uh, partly because of this genetic evidence, one of the uh, most prevailing uh, idea is that gain of function or too many copies of absolute gain can cause neurodegeneration. Therefore, one of the ways to treat uh, neurodegeneration is probably to get rid of absolute gain. For example, using absolutely targeting antibodies or um, ASOs. However, as a basic scientist, or whenever you talk about getting rid of one protein to treat some disease, you always wonder what is the basic function of this, uh, uh, of this disease causing gene. In this case, absolutely is one of the most abundant proteins in the brain. Uh, of course, I'm not the first one asking this question. Since the absolute gene was identified more than 20 years ago, there were accumulating uh, um, um, studies showing that um, absolutely has been identified as a predominantly presynaptically localized protein. And because of its natural curvature, it interacts with presynaptic membrane particularly vesicular release, uh, vesicular uh, uh, vesicles. And uh, functionally, uh, the consensus is that absolutely actually can inhibit uh, a synaptic release, uh, endocytosis and exocytosis process. However, one caveat is that all these functional studies, almost all the functional studies, are using overexpression of absolutely. For a couple of decades, one of the most mystery, uh, mysterious thing about afsynuclein is, um, even though it is most one of the most abundant proteins in the brain, even though it has a high penetrance in Parkinson's disease, there's a very mild or almost no phenotype in absolutely in that conditions. And uh, so this actually really motivated, motivated me and motivated, motivated our lab to pursue the endogenous function of uh, absolute pain. So at least here, you probably noticed already. So all these previous work were actually were using classic synaptic uh, uh, models, for example, chromatin cells or mouse hippocampus or even kids' health uh, in Yang Wu's paper here as a model of synapse to look at the uh, 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 release uh, uh, phenotype. However, absolute is a Parkinson's disease uh, uh, gene, right? So the, the, these uh, experimental um, um, materials are great model for synapse. However, they actually do not show any uh, phenotype in disease conditions. So therefore we started looking at the corticostridal synapses. This is actually taken from one of my PhD work. Um, uh, um, Michelle and I and others showed that in a disease condition, there is a dramatic loss of corticostridal synapses, particularly in the indirect pathway uh, uh, spiny projection neurons. And this is uh, uh, true in mouse and rat, 
This is also true in human patients. Um, this is a, post of a human postmodern tissue taken from Parkinson's disease patients. You can see simplified dendritic branches and loss of dendritic spines. Therefore, when my, post uh, my, when my graduate student Eddie joined the lab, we decided to use corticosteroidal synapse to, as a place to start pro uh, probing the function of absolute care. And also, um, this work was a close collaboration between uh, Tom Shudoff's lab. Uh, in Tom's lab, uh, uh, they generated uh, a alpha, beta, gamma, triple synuclein knockout mice. So in this case, we knock out all three uh, members of synucleans to, to, to explore the, the, the uh, phenotype. And this work was also uh, aided by postdoc Yue Sung, and she uh, helped a lot in um, this project. So when Eddie started uh, probing uh, uh, the synaptic transmission in alpha, beta, gamma, triple synuclein uh, knockout mice, we basically asked this same very simple question. We had a hunch, maybe synucleans are doing something at the synapse, but where and what, we really don't know. We started uh, asking, whether they have impaired basal synaptic transmission or short-term or long-term synaptic plasticity. So uh, Eddie generated the um, a cortical striatal, uh, tissues and then started with a very simple experiment using electrical stimulation, stimulate cortical inputs, and then record the postsynaptic response. And then you can see this is a typical, we call the input output curve when you increase uh, synap uh, stimulation intensity, you'll see a stronger um, occurrence. And uh, if we compare the, the wild type condition and the triple knockout condition, you can see essentially there's no differences in input output curve. And also in majority of the uh, experimental conditions, we not only look at the young animal, young adult animal in three months old, we also look at uh, aged animal. Um, uh, more than uh, one year and a half old. The idea is that if we see some phenotype in only aging conditions, but not the young conditions, maybe this is a disease um, aging related uh, uh, adaptation. Only if we see uh, things that are consistent in young and old conditions, this is probably the endogenous synaptic function. So for the rest of my talk, I'm only going to show you the data from three months old because in our hands, every phenotype, we, major phenotype we saw actually are consistent in both young adult conditions and aging conditions. So these data shows that no obvious change in synaptic strength, which is pretty much consistent with what people have seen in the past decade. Okay, this is an uh, input output curve. What about uh, short term plasticity? So we can give. Um, different high frequency sti stimuli and look at the response. These are from wild type mice and these are from uh, significant triple knockout mice. And you can see largely they are identical. For uh, people who really pay close attention, you probably noticed here are a couple of data points. You probably can put a couple of stars there. These are statistically significant, but however, this is really mild phenotype is consistent with previous uh, findings. And overall, there's no major change in short-term synaptic plasticity. What about long-term synaptic plasticity? This is where the endoplanoids uh, comes into play. So uh, adequate striatal synapses, one of the most prominent and most uh, characterized uh, synaptic plasticity is this uh, endoplanoid dependent LTP. So for those of you who don't know endoplanoids, uh, these in the textbook, they are classified as one of these uh, um, classic uh, examples of retrograde signaling. Endocannabinoids are released from postnaptic side, usually caused by uh, calcium or activity. And then they can be released from postnaptic side and then go across the synaptic cleft and uh, activate the factor, which is CB1 receptor at the presynaptic terminal in this case. And the activation of uh, CB1 receptor could suppress calcium and suppress synaptic transmission. So how do we record it? Where, uh, what we did was to record the cortical synaptic synaptic transmission, and then we put on DHPG, which is the mgr one receptor uh, agonist, and then paired with a little bit depolarization, you can see this uh, induction uh, protocol can cause long lasting suppression. Okay? And also this is a presynaptic uh, suppression of presynaptic release 
because you can see it reliable um, pair increase of pair pass ratio together with the suppression of the amplitude. And this is a statistic uh, a summary of a group of cells we recorded. And also this kind of depression is depending on the CB1 receptor activation, uh, AM251, which is CB1 receptor antagonist, can completely block this uh, uh, long-term depression. And what happens in the significant triple knot numbers? We were very surprised to see that in, in significant triple knot numbers, uh, DHPG cannot induce LTD anymore. Okay, so this is the one of this is when Eddie and I got really excited. This is the first time we actually see a strong and major uh, synaptic phenotype in these uh, significant knot numbers. And uh, of course, you want to say, hey, what's happening here, right? You are you have a loss of LTD, and we're using the HPG to induce LTD. What what about other um, uh, 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 similar synaptic uh, plasticity involved involving endocrine release? So we we'll look at the DSI in the neighboring inhibitory neurons. In this case, we can simply depolarize the cell to zero millivolt for a few seconds. And then you can see in this immediately after depolarization, you see fewer events. Even if there were a few events, you can see the amplitude is suppressed. This is called the depolarization induced suppression of inhibition, DSI. And DSI does not require activation of m one receptors. And uh, you can see that um, in significant triple knockout eyes, mice, the DSI is also abolished. So together, this data suggests that Indeed, synuclein knockout mice have impaired endocannabinoid dependent uh, synaptic plasticity in both the excitatory synapses and also in inhibitory synapses. And because of time, I'm not showing the data here. You have to believe me. We also tried this in hippocampus, the uh, endocannabinoid dependent LTD in hippocampus and endocannabinoid dependent uh, DSI in hippocampus was, were also abolished in synuclein triple knockout mice. Okay, this is a major phenotype. Now, what is the mechanism? So, as I mentioned, that uh, there are uh, pre the the after nuclear is predominantly um, a class uh, a recognized as a presynaptic protein, right? So, we really want to look at this uh, mechanism, go step by step, and then see at which um, a step the 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 uh, um, plasticity is impaired. So because uh, absolutely has been recognized as a presynaptic protein, we, we first look at the presynaptic modulation. In this case, we directly put on CB1 receptor agonist, which is a wing compound. Right? You can see the direct activation of the CB1 receptor, you get this long lasting suppression. Okay? And uh, in nuclear and triple knockout mice, actually, we also see this strong suppression uh, which is almost identical as wild type mice. So in this case, these data actually suggest that presynaptic CB1 receptor modulation is intact in significant and triple knot numbers. So if it's not presynaptic defect, that really suggests it is postsynaptic defect. So how do we test this? So one way we test this is we can load the endocannabinoid, in this case, uh, an anatomide AA, Inside the Pashkan pipette, when we form the whole cell recording, we can directly dialyze the whole cell with AEA. So this approach has two major advantages. One is that it really bypasses the induction protocol because it does not require the synthesis of AEA anymore. Okay. And the second is this is a pure postsynaptic manipulation. So in this case, um, in wild-time mice, you can see when we directly dialyze cell with AEA, you can see gradual suppression of synaptic transmission. And also this uh, uh, suppression is completely dependent on AM251, which is pre-synaptic uh, CB1 receptor uh, antagonist. And uh, to, consistent with what we saw previously, in synaptic, in significant triple knockout mice, the suppression is completely gone. So, this really indicates that the major action is happening on the postsynaptic side, and also the postsynaptic endocannabinoid release is, but not the synthesis is impaired in the significant triple knockout conditions. Okay. So, um, these are recording of uh, excitatory synaptic transmission as a proxy for uh, 
for endocampal release. Uh, to directly measure endocampal release, we cover with uh, Yulong Lee's group at uh, Peking University. Yulong and his graduate student, uh, uh, although um, generated this uh, wonderful graph uh, sensor, which is based on human CE uh, receptor. Um, and then they put on the um, uh, circuit permitted, permitted EGFP upon activation, uh, upon binding up the, uh, with the uh, endocannabinoid, this sensor can increase their fluorescence intensity. This is the wild type conditions. Here what we, I show, we injected a sensor ECB 2.0. You can see a local electrical stimulation can induce uh, endocannabinoid release. And also you can put on uh, uh, an directly, in this case, AEA, you can see it enhanced of the sensor signal, and all these signals can be blocked by C1 receptor antagonist AM51 again. And this is the wild type conditions in the significant triple knockout mice conditions. We can see that uh, stimulation cannot evoke reliable sens sensor signal anymore, but the agonist itself can still uh, enhance sensor signals, suggesting the sensor actually is working fine in the significant triple knockout mass. Just the release of the endocannabinoid is, is impaired. Here's the statistics. So together with um, sensor and uh, electrophysiology, we really think that postsynaptic uh, uh, endocannabinoid release uh, requires the significance. So, this is against the, our um, uh, knowledge from the literature, right? Because um, the previous uh, literature really suggests that after nuclear is acting at the presynaptic time aside. So how do we really confirm this? So to do this, uh, we designed the following experiment. So we generate um, AAV expressing afternoon and then we injected into stratum of significant triple knockout and uh, we sparsely label them. We can record the, uh, the neurons that are JP positive or JP negative. Sorry, my computer is acting out. I don't know what's going on. Here we go. So uh, we can sparsely uh, uh, infect the striatal neurons. We can record the JP positive and JP negative cells. In this case, JP negative cells are significant triple knockouts. And the JFP positive cells are the cells that after nuclear is rescued. And then you can see from the results clearly already, expression of full length after nuclear on the post-synaptic side can successfully rescue this uh, uh, independent dependent LTB. So this data really confirms that nuclear is acting on the post-synaptic side uh, to um, re regulate uh, endocannabinoid dependent LTB. So I just want to have a, a quick summary on what we see so far. We really see that uh, in the significant triple knockout mice that um, in two different brewing regions and the two different uh, type of synapses, afternoon working at post epic site can directly regulate and collaborate dependent LPD. Well, so then the question is how, right? As I mentioned, you know, uh, even endocannabinoid release itself actually is not well understood because uh, endocannabinoids are lipids. So one of the prevailing idea is that the release of endocannabinoid does not require release machineries, unlike the other uh, class of neurotransmitters. It may, may be able to directly diffuse across the, uh, the postsynaptic membrane to activate presynaptic uh, CPRN receptors. So is this true? And how do we test this? So we think in order to answer this question, we still need to come back to afternuclein because we have very clean phenotype. And we went back to look at the afternuclein structural uh, and functional analysis. For this, I really want to uh, uh, mention this paper done by Jacqueline Burrow when she was a postdoc at Tom Schudoff's lab. Uh, Jacqueline basically generate, it's a very heroic uh, uh, um, effort. Jacqueline basically generated all the mutations you can think of throughout the whole afternuclein protein, right? She identified that the C-terminus of afternuclein is really important for uh, calcium binding and in term, uh, important for protein-protein interactions. And the N-terminus of the afternuclein, you can see this afternuclein structure forming this curved structure is really important for lipid binding. 
And also, she identified that these two amino acids, A11P and the 370P, are particularly important for um, uh, interaction with membranes. If we mutate these two amino acids, the, the membrane interaction of a property of the Fs nucleon can be completely disrupted. Inspired by this results, we generate a series of uh, AAVs. Uh, so use, uh, we can, um, uh, in, we, can, we generate AAVs that express a full length Zaps nuclear or a, a truncation of the C terminus or mutation of uh, alpha helical structures and also um, uh, alpha nuclear mutations that are related to Parkinson's disease. So the approach is very similar to what I've just mentioned. We can inject these alpha nuclear um, AAVs into the uh, C terminus of uh, uh, injected this. Uh, IAVs into the stratum of this nuclear triple nacomys, and then to record uh, JP expression cells, which are rescue cells, or the JP negative cells, which are the nuclear triple knockout cells. And then um, to um, um, cut the long story short, I just want to show you a couple of major findings from this uh, long list of characterization. So I, uh, as I mentioned before, full lens afternoon can fully rescue and can be released. If we inject AAVs um, with the C terminus truncation, only the N terminus, actually, we can fully rescue the LPD. These are this curve, okay? So, suggesting that C termini is not required for synuclein interaction with endocrine abilities. And interestingly, um, just with two amino acids uh, uh, deletion, in this case, uh, A11P and V70P can disrupt the membrane interaction. In this case, the aptonuclein uh, uh, mutation cannot rescue LTD. And in addition, a Parkinson's disease uh, a mutation, A30P, are functions almost identical as what I'm showing you here. I'm not showing that data. I cannot rescue LTD. Okay, so this data really shows that membrane interaction uh, mechanisms required for endocrinatory release. So when we think about membrane interaction mechanism and the neurotransmitter release, we cannot uh, 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 help mentioning our collaborator Tom Trudolph for identifying the presynaptic uh, uh, snare protein complex and their function in presynaptic release. What happens in the post side? Is there possible that similar mechanism is acting as well? So actually, Tom Shudoff, Lu Chen, Rob Malenka lab already showed that the postsynaptic snare proteins are important for synaptic plasticity, such as MPA receptor insertion in uh, LTP and uh, homeostatic synaptic plasticity. So is it possible that similar processes are also important for endocrine release to directly test this? Um, Yue and uh, Eddie generate AAVs uh, and in lenti virus in this case uh, uh, carrying um, tennis toxin which is, can cleave the uh, snare protein function and then you can see that in cells um, in, this is a wild type animal in cells that express lenti tennis toxin the LTD is uh, almost completely abolished so this is LTD what about BSI uh, it is also uh, abolished in um, lenti expression conditions. And lastly, uh, what about AEA loading conditions? So this is a case where we directly put uh, AEA in the uh, patch plan pipette, and then you can see that in wild type conditions, um, uh, AEA can suppress synaptic transmission in lenti expression cells. The LTD or the, the suppression of synaptic transmission is completely abolished. So altogether. It really shows that postsynaptic uh, tetanus toxin dependent uh, exocytosis process is important for endocrine release. I really want to mention that um, so 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 shows that a classic presynaptic and snare protein um, uh, synaptic transmission kind of mechanism also work on the postsynaptic side to regulate endocrine uh, release. Before I end my talk, I really want to mention that our major finding actually is quite different from what we read from the literature. This is a work from uh, Richard Wilson and uh, Roger Nicole um, published 
more than 20 years ago now. So in their work, uh, they showed that they use a very similar approach. In this case, uh, dialysis cell with botulinum toxin type B and type E in the pipe, patch pipe, clamp pipe, pipette. And uh, Botox cannot abolish the DSI. So in the past couple of decades, it's been a consensus that endoplasmic release does not require snare proteins. However, uh, our data um, shows the opposite. Uh, we think there are two major reasons. One of the reasons is that botulinum toxin is a relatively large protein. If you dialyze directly through patch pipette, it takes a really long time to dialyze all the way till, for example, the digitic spine, so these small compartments. Um, and uh, secondly, maybe the uh, snare proteins are not accessible until um, some uh, high activity. Therefore, um, the Botox probably couldn't uh, fully dialysis uh, and uh, cleave the available uh, snare proteins. In our case, we're expressing um, tender toxin in cells for days. And uh, before I end the talk, I really want to also mention an uh, interesting uh, observation. So since this result was published, actually we couldn't find a second paper to repeat this result. So, so um, uh, my question and I had uh, long discussions about this as well, right? So this is a very uh, important uh, result. Uh, we do want to uh, um, emphasize, you know, how important it is to uh, complete, uh, com uh, to repeat already published results and uh, to build our hypothesis uh, based on your own findings and previous uh, findings. And uh, even though this work is now published in the preprint era, we actually already put this paper on BioCAD. Um, if uh, some details I didn't cover here, uh, you can find uh, in this uh, BioCAD paper. And uh, lastly, I just want to acknowledge the people who did this work. Uh, Eddie did most of the work uh, with help from Yue and also um, uh, Shudoff Lab, uh, Yulong Li Lab, uh, and also uh, Jiexian Lab at Harvard provide help and also would like to thank uh, funding uh, NIH and Greenwich to host up here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen, for that interesting talk. We um, have time for questions. I might start with one uh, question. Um, so you motivated the talk by saying that therapies are going to be targeting alpha synuclein with ASOs or antibodies and but you want to figure out what the normal function of the gene is in case knocking it down is problematic um, but then all of your studies seem to be in the triple knockout um, uh, so those so therapies necessarily will not be targeting beta and gamma I'm just wondering in some of your rescue experiments especially the ones with the where you're introducing uh, alpha synuclein or the mutants um, post into postsynaptic neurons. Have you tried that with like gamma synuclein or beta synuclein? Uh, that's a really good question. We actually didn't um, because um, the uh, genetics about uh, beta and gamma and its relevance to disease uh, is not really uh, well documented as absolutely. And second is um, the structure of beta gamma synuclein are extremely similar uh, with alpha. And also there were a couple of papers uh, didn't get major attention showing that absolutely and knockout mice actually do have compensation, uh, elevated expression of beta gamma, which normally wouldn't be there. So, so uh, and in the paper, we actually uh, showed that uh, we did the the major experiment in alpha only knockout and also beta gamma double knockout mice. So the phenotype is reduced in either alpha or beta gamma double knockouts. So there is definitely compensation there. Does that answer your question? But I, um, sure, but I, I, I think, but you're, what, I think you concluded from your experiment where you introduced alpha synuclein into postsynaptic neurons that in the triple knockout, the alpha synuclein Function was required for functioning postsynaptically. I think that was your conclusion. Yes. Yes. I, but, um, I, and another hypothesis is that any synuclein, especially gamma synuclein, is the one that's doing it. It's not alpha synuclein. So, is there a way for you to make knockouts specifically, single knockouts in the postsynaptic neurons to test that formally? Oh. Uh, 
that's a tricky one. We don't have single knockout of each, and we do have absolute and triple uh, single knockout, and the phenotype is reduced. It's to the same direction, but not as clean. So if, if that's what you mean. And at also the same time, I want to emphasize that even though we're emphasizing the postsynaptic function, we're not discounting the presynaptic function at all. So the, 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 the only reason that we're, em we're emphasizing here is because we knocked it out of all, and now we can put back on the, to the postsynaptic side targetedly uh, very cleanly, so without the presynaptic function getting involved. So it's just for, but, but what, for I'm, what I'm saying is that, uh, put, right, yeah. what, what, what I'm saying is that when you, here's alpha synuclein, but in that overexpression situation, Waves of sequence similarity, especially the truncation in which the n termini of alpha and gamma are are almost identical. It's especially with overexpression. It's unclear if you're studying just alpha synuclein or just a general oh, property oh, of uh, synucleins. Yeah, finally, I get your question. Thank you. So, so I I don't think um, uh, um, uh, the beta gamma synuclein would make any major differences. So my prediction would be because of the similarity of their sequences, if you put back gamma smithing, maybe this function can be also uh, uh, rescued. So, so here, that's why in top title, I said, you know, smithing dependent uh, and the release, I, not necessarily just alpha only. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um. Hey, can I, I have a quick, can I have a question? When, when does work? Who is talking? Hey, Jun, this is Shin. Okay. Oh, actually I have a question it's related to the age. So does this phenotype, the LTD phenotype, it's related or has any relationship with the aging? For example, the older mice, the triple knockout, the phenotype is more dramatic or actually for your rescue, are there any, for example, you put this, after looking back, can the rescue actually more efficiently in younger animals or in older animals? Oh, okay. So, is there any age aging dependent uh, yeah. differences in this phenotype? The answer is no. So, we recorded both in uh, young adult and three month animal, and also sixteen to eighteen month old animals. Um, is you basically see identical uh, thing where. Uh, the LTD is flat, uh, the SI is flat, there's no difference uh, in, in young and aging. But we did not rescue in aging conditions. We only rescued in the three month old animal because we ran out of an uh, old animal. And uh, because all the phenotypes are consistent, you know, it didn't, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, age animal for that specific set of experiments. So for this triple knockout, are these kind of like the embryonic knockout or the conditional triple knockout? I just oh, curious. these are all embryonic uh, knockout. Okay. Yeah. Julian, that's a good point to consider because uh, you mentioned compensation and there's definitely evidence that germline knockouts have different phenotypes and transient knockdowns. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Zhao Xuan, your question? Please. Hi, uh, that's a really great talk. So I have a question regarding your conclusion that the membrane binding properties of alpha synuclein is necessary to rescue uh, or is necessary for the C, uh, ECB release. So you show that the uh, Parkinson disease associated mutations couldn't bind to membrane and doesn't rescue. But if I remember correctly, you showed that the C term C-terminal deletion doesn't bind to the membrane, but that can rescue? Yes. So what's the question? Yes. So, so yes. So basically this mutation, it doesn't bind to the membrane, but it also doesn't rescue. But if I remember correctly, the previous one showing that the C-terminal deletion uh, doesn't bind to the membrane either, correct? But that's- Oh, oh okay. So, so- so, so the C terminus uh, deletion here is only delete the we call the protein binding uh, domain, and in this case, uh, 
there are a couple of papers showing in the presynaptic terminal actually can bind the presynaptic step protein, for example, step 25. But they do still bind with lipids and the membrane because the end terminus have after helical structure is intact. Oh, but I see. Yeah, but in this case where you mutate A11 and the V70 uh, to proline uh, residue and actually disrupts the membrane uh, binding protein of a property. In this case, actually, uh, people speculate that this helical structure actually is uh, disrupted. They don't fold uh, normally. And so is the A30P. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Kaiwen? Uh, hi, Jing. Jin, a very beautiful work, and I have several questions regarding your work. And uh, uh, first one is, uh, um, so we know that endocannabinoid-dependent LGD is a very dominant mechanism in the inhibitor synapses. So what do you think about the, uh, the alpha synuclein's the, the mechanism you discover here in the SPN, uh, will that be also like um, be useful for the yeah, for the inhibitor synapses? In yes. Other... Yeah. So we actually showed. Sorry, I wasn't clear. The DSI here, depolarization induced suppression of inhibition, is mm -hmm. done in the inhibitor synapses in the in the striatum, and also okay. we repeated and also we repeated this experiment in hippocampus as well. Okay. So, great. Great. So both the excitation and inhibition that endocannabinoid dependent uh, modulations are abolished. Okay, great. Um, this, so the second question is, um, so the postsynaptic neurons also release uh, many other retrograde signaling molecules. So do, do you think the alpha synuclein in the postsynapse will regulate the other, such as uh, like, you know, the other retrograde signaling molecules as well? Sorry, you know, I, I we, we didn't test others. So okay. this is uh, as far as we can conclude uh, to, to me, this is already quite productive and uh, we, we know, can only yeah, make yeah, a is. conclusion based on what we can see. <laughs> yes, it is. So um, one more question is about the pre and post synaptic alpha synaptic So uh, that's been like a cano canonical known that the pre alpha synaptic are most enriched in the pre synaptic terminals. Um, in the PD, it's, it's been a long debate how does loss of avacinucleum may contribute to the uh, PD symptoms? So what do you think about this postsynaptic mechanisms? What is the contributions to the uh, pathologies detected, observed in PD? Okay. Versus so, the presynaptic avacinucleum? Yeah, so, so that's a really great question. So, so first of all, I think we have to separate uh, two different conditions, right? One is in the control condition versus the pathological condition. So avacinucleum can kill neuron. Uh, only in uh, aggregate form, right? So mm -hmm. if tolerable in uh, a monomer, not really high con uh, concentration, they're fine, right? So, 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 aggregates, aggregation, and uh, uh, these two neurodegeneration, to me, I think it, it's it's completely different uh, uh, aspect of this protein, even though we're talking about you know the same protein. But in terms of um, uh, the, the postsynaptic function, how that contributes to maybe some of the PD phenotypes. So, so one way I think of is in the aggregate condition, right? You 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 have um, pathological conditions. So for example, absolutely fibrils. If you inject fibrils, you can induce endogenous action here to form for, to phosphorylate and form aggregates. So work from uh, University of Alabama showed that in the uh, aggregate form, actually the endogenous soluble aptitude is quenched. So in, the, in that sense, it's almost acting at like a knockout condition. So you imagine with aggregates, with the quenching of endogenous aptitude, you would predict that you have loss of endocannabinoid function in Parkinson's disease condition, which is exactly what people have been reporting for many years, right? People have been talking about loss of endocannabinoid dependent plasticity in PD conditions. Many were attributing to, you know, dopamine modulation or loss of dopamine modulation. But I do think in this case, 
um, it has something to do with after nuclear as well, mm-hmm. particularly in cases where after nuclear aggregates or Lewy body uh, pathology is pre- are present. Okay, great. Thank you. Good, good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank great you, talk. Howard. Thank you for a great question. Wait, Jin, you, you just said you, in the beginning, you said you think the aggregated form is, pathological form is causing some different effect than loss of function. But then in the end, you said you think through aggregation, it's causing a loss of function. I'm just trying to figure out it, what it, what do you think is going on with pathology? Is it a loss of synuclein's yeah. function? Or, or That's a great question, right? So like I mentioned, like I mentioned to Kai Wen, when you think about uh, neurodegeneration and the synaptic function, it, it doesn't have to be, these are two different processes, right? So let's say you lost endopamidoid release, it doesn't necessarily lead to degeneration. You know, CB1 receptor and ACAL, they live fine, right? But when you have aggregates, these will have totally different, uh, you know, set of cascades. You know, you, you study all these different uh, aggregates of uh, disease relevant proteins, right? So that's a whole different type of beast we're talking about, right? And so, yes, in the beginning of my talk, I do use aggregates to motivate or disease relevance to motiv- motivate. But I do think that you know these findings are pretty much uh, basic biology of disease relevant genes or disease relevant proteins. In you know, non disease, not to get conditions. into it too much. Yeah. But well, but if your protein that's so critical is aggregating into a Lewy body, it's not going to be around to have some normal function, and that might be important. I'm just wanting to get a sense if you think. Um, that that sort of aggregation is depleting the function and that the, the normal function you've discovered here, if that is relevant for disease. Well, so I do think it, it has something to do with, for example, cognitive uh, defects in Parkinson's disease, right? You're losing this major synaptic plasticity. So, so okay. maybe explain that part, but I don't think loss of endothelial release can explain the degeneration part. Okay, um, Cao Mian. Hi, Jing, great talk. I have a quick question. Uh, so uh, can you detect endogenous alpha synuclein in the spine by the- <laughs> Or the EM? Sorry, there are two different ways. Uh, so can I, can I detect alpha synuclein in spines? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. by the scanning or the EM. Because yes, so, you do the antibody labeling, the pre yeah. signal is very strong. So, so exactly. So in wild type conditions, if you directly stay at nuclear, all you see is a pre a really bright spot, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's really uh, 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 abundant. So uh, here I didn't show actually uh, Jay Shen's group at Harvard. She helped us to generate a synapsal uh, uh, prep. And then in that prep, she could uh, um, separate the presynaptic uh, compartment, and postsynaptic compartment, and then using the uh, postsynaptic uh, uh, a part of the synapsal, uh, ex- uh, you know, in vitro uh, material, she could detect after nuclear in using Western blot. Uh, but again, yes, it is there, but content-wise is much lower than presynaptic terminal. Okay. And you think at pre, uh, post-synaptic, uh, it's also associated with certain type of vesicles or just... Uh, we don't know. That's a really great question. So okay. for that, I think we really need to make a snooping with, uh, with tag and then to do systematic uh, search. Yeah. Or maybe EM can help you too. Exactly. Yeah. EM and super resolution or even pull down and uh, that type of uh, approach. Yeah. We haven't done yet. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, any question, other questions? We have uh, Sabojit here, Alpha Synuclein world expert. I don't know if he wants to weigh in on anything. Uh, don't put me on the spot. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> uh, no, I like I like the talk very much. Um, so um, sorry, I don't know if my camera is working. Um, but yeah, the only um, the only thing I was thinking that you know, given the similarities between alpha, beta, and gamma, your overexpression experiment, you know, would work 
whether it's alpha, beta, or gamma, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and if you, you know, if you take the, I heard what you said about the synaptosome, but if you take all the synuclein data that's available in the literature, you know, it's pretty clear that it's in the pre-synapse and it's not in the post-synapse. So I think one of the things that uh, I think Aaron mentioned it, but might, uh, might uh, clarify whether it's an alpha, beta, gamma is to actually not the overexpression paradigm, but some sort of a knockout paradigm of the post-synaptic neuron. That, that is the only thing that would... Uh, yeah, thank you. That's my opinion, but the data are beautiful. I, I love to talk. Uh, it was very good. Thank you for the suggestion. We're going to outbreath our smiles. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> we don't have those data at this moment. Yeah, thank you. And also, I was thinking that we actually mapped the uh, synuclein vamp to site to uh -huh. exactly these three amino acids, which is 96, 97, and 98. Uh, we published uh -huh. in PNS, I think, 2019. Yeah. So though if you mutate those three to alanine, then synuclein cannot bind to AMP2 anymore. So that may be useful in one of your experiments. Okay, that's a fantastic suggestion. I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah, we don't Thank have... Thank you. We, yeah. But uh, to follow up uh, your, your comment on uh, whether they are postsynaptic side or not, right? Uh, one way I think of it is, you know, absinuclein uh, fibrils, which you know, people use all the time these days they will jump from one neuron to another, right? It only works if at the synapse, both sides, they have it. Um, I think the, what they've shown is that if you, if you um, the aggregation in the postsynaptic neuron is mostly in the neurites and the cell body. So I'm not sure, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that if the synuclein is aggregating after dropping the fibrils, then it has to be in the post synapse. I'm not so sure or, if I've shown it in the post synapse. It's just the or it right. jumps from you know one cell to another, right? So you have to induce endogenous, you know, synuclein to 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 work. Oh, out. I think the idea is not not so much. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean it goes in, but the thing that is aggregating is the post is the. Uh, synuclein that's in the host, not the synuclein that's actually being transmitted. I, so see, that, I see. That's that's pretty clear. So the transmitted synuclein goes in, and then it acts as a, I mean, Aaron knows this a lot, but acts as a seed to aggregate the synuclein that's in the host cell. That's the concept there. Yeah. So so you're arguing that uh, uh, the 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 only aggregate form goes to the postsynaptic side, but not the soluble one. No, the soluble will go, but then it will aggregate the synuclein, endogenous synuclein that's there at the post. Yeah. So I can imagine that that could happen. Yeah. In, in disease states, when you have more synuclein everywhere, maybe. I mean, obviously, Louis mm -hmm. neurites are found in dendrites. Exactly. So in pathologic states, you could have that. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. And that paper that Sabojit mentioned has a co author named. Daniel Gittler, but I have no idea who that is. It's no relationship to me. Okay, good. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> he's very good. He's in Israel. Good guy. Yeah. And Kylan, do you have another question or is your hand just raised? Okay. All right. Looks like that covers everything. Um, Great, thanks, Jin. Uh, oh, thank uh, you lots again. of questions because it because it because the findings are very provocative and interesting. So thanks for sharing the great story. Thank you. Thanks, Jin. Um, yeah, thank thanks, Tipe. Thanks, Jin. Good to see you, Zong. Yeah. See everyone. Thank you uh, next week. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you.